It's so great to see all of you today. I am really excited to um, give you some updates on what's happening with pancreatic cancer research, developments that you are helping make possible. And we're so grateful to all of you for your support. And we're gonna really focus in today on some of the things that we heard about in PanCan's recent scientific summit. So for those of you who I have not had the chance to meet, my name is Julie Fleshman. I'm the president and CEO of PanCan. Um, and again, just thrilled to, to be with all of you today. So we're gonna be looking today at some of the highlights from PanCan's recent scientific summit. Our scientific summit is an annual gathering that we do of all of the different researchers that PanCan is funding along with many of our advisors. So it's a wonderful opportunity to hear and get an update on some of the research grants that you are all um, funding um, and to bring everyone together for collaboration um, and, and moving things to the next level. So I'm joined today by a panel of experts who all participated in PanCan Scientific Summit, and they're gonna provide you with some of the highlights um, from the summit and just areas of pancreatic cancer research that show promise right now that we're all excited about. So before we get to our expert panel, um, a few housekeeping things. Everyone can relax, um, you're on mute, your videos are off, so you don't have to worry, we can't see you. Um, our Q&A session, we will absolutely open it up for Q&A at the end, um, but please feel free to go ahead as you have questions, put them into the Q&A box, uh, and um, we'll, that way they'll be all lined up and ready for us um, when we get to, the, get to the end. We're also recording this webinar, um, so we will make that available to you after the webinar if you want to listen to it again or um, maybe pass it on to your, to your friends and colleagues. If you need anything while we're here together today, um, you can email Sierra. Her email address is on the screen. Please jot that down if you're having um, any technical issues or need anything else um, throughout the webinar. So before we get started, I wanna take a moment and just thank our scientific and medical affairs industry members. Um, they provide support to all of PanCan's scientific and medical initiatives and, and we couldn't do what we do without them. So you to AbbVie, AstraZeneca, Fibrogen, Immunovia, Ipsen, LabCorp Oncology, Novacure, Novartis, Pfizer, Raphael, Tempest, and Time. I also want to thank our event sponsors today, AstraZeneca, Grail, and Ipsen. Thank you for making these uh, webinars possible. And finally, a big thank you to all of you, um, to our wonderful and amazing donors. We are so grateful for your continued passionate commitment to everything that PanCan is doing. You make our work possible and I'm just so incredibly grateful. Um, there's a lot to discuss today, so let's get started. And I'm excited to introduce our panel of experts. First, uh, joining me is Lynn Matrizian, who is PanCan's Chief Science Officer. Lynn brings extensive cancer research experience and business training to provide strategic direction for all of PanCan's scientific and research initiatives. Before joining PanCan, Lynn worked for 25 years leading a research laboratory dedicated to understanding cancer metastasis. So welcome, Lynn. Next, Dr. Susan Bates is a professor at Columbia University. She received a PanCan Translational Research Grant for her project titled, Exploiting a Metabolic Vulnerability Created by Epigenetic Therapy. So welcome, uh, Dr. Bates. Next, uh, Dr. Channing Durr, who received a 2015 PanCan Research Acceleration Network grant for his research on defining novel combination KRAS targeted thera therapeutic strategies. He is a Sarah Brown Kennan Distinguished Professor and the Director of Integrated Training in Cancer Model Systems, Program Department of Pharmacology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he's also a member of PanCan Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. And finally, uh, Jillian Gresham, who is an assistant professor at Cedar sinai Medical Center. She received a PanCan Career Development Award in memory of Skip Vera, 
for her project titled Evaluating Objective Measures of Physical Function in Pancreatic Cancer. So all of those titles sound complicated, but we're going to try to make them un uncomplicated today and, and in our conversation with these experts and telling you about what they're working on. So let's jump in. And Lynn, I'm gonna start with you. Um, you have a great perspective on PanCan strategy and our investment in research. So can you talk a little bit about what are the principles that make up PanCan strategy and how we decide what are our prior priorities for research investment? Sure, Julie, but first let me say hi to everybody. It's great to be able to spend this time together even if it's virtual. So. Yes, our strategy for research investment. Well, that's something that we take very seriously. We wanna be good stewards of the, the donor research investment uh, the donors make into us. Um, and so we think about it quite a bit. And, and what we think about is um, making sure we understand what's happening in the pancreatic cancer research field and then looking for gaps and in particular opportunities where we may be able to leverage what's happening and, and make a um, kind of accelerate it so it makes a big difference and really starts um, impacting patients. And so as I was thinking about this, I thought of a, of a little diagram. So Sierra, if you would put up my slide, I just have one little slide as a diagram that, that I thought might help. Um, and so the overall goal is to get the, the top of this pyramid. So we want improved detection, diagnosis, treatment, and care for pancreatic cancer. And the way we get that is with clinical research. So we have, there's a new idea that comes out. We have to test that in people in clinical trials to, to see if it's really better than what we have now. And that's how we make those, those advancements. Well, where do those new ideas come from? Well, they start at the very base of that pyramid with basic research. It comes from understanding how normal cells work so that we can then understand how pancreatic cancer cells work. It comes from understanding the molecules and all the, the complicated biochemical systems that happen inside a cell. But then to take that knowledge and turn it into a clinical trial, an idea we can test in people, has to go through a stage of research that we call translational research. And that's really very critical on, on how we um, get those ideas up there. So it's really from that base of knowledge. So the way I think about what we do is that we build an elevator that goes right up the middle of that pyramid, right to the top. And we look for what's happening in the field and say, well, does this piece of information, is that gonna be important for improved detection, improved treatment? Um, and, and we see what's there because we can't fund everything. The National Cancer Institute funds um, a lot of basic research, the pharmaceutical companies fund a lot of clinical research. We want to leverage that information and get it kind of all together. So it's like um, we're looking if, if our elevator is going up and we open the door and there's nothing there and there's something we need. Well, that's an opportunity that we can invest in. It's a gap that's important um, to get us to the top of that pyramid. And if there's somebody doing something that's very exciting and very important at that floor, then we invite them in our elevator and we kind of get a community together so that together we can really um, form a cohesive group that will more effectively and more efficiently get us to where we wanna go, which is that improved detection, diagnosis, treatment, and care. Great, Lynn, that was a fantastic, I like your analogy of the elevator. Um, so we're all riding up the elevator together here um, as we put the pieces together to accelerate progress. So Lynn, of course, an important part of PanCan's strategy is to create a community of researchers that collaborate and support each other. And we call that PanCan's Community for Progress. Can you talk about the Community for Progress and why PanCan's annual scientific summit that we just held is an important part of it? Yeah, Community for Progress is a term we 
coined a few years ago to try to explain what it was that we've been doing really since the beginning of PanCan. And that is um, forming a group, a cohesive group with a common goal that's attacking a big problem, the problem of pancreatic cancer. And so we think that if I think about again, my, maybe my elevator analogy, um, the people, if we can make the people in the elevator know each other, like each other, when we open the doors, people want to join us on the elevator, then, then that makes us so much more effective in getting where we want to go. So that's really our community of progress, setting up that environment um, where people want to join us and where they can see that together we're so much stronger. And the summit is such an important part of that. That's really where we share our scientific knowledge, where people get to ask questions, where you get to meet the other people in the field, and where we really start forming that bond that will help us get where we want to go. Yeah, it's great. And we really do hear from people at the scientific summit, you know, they're working with other people that they met at last year's scientific summit. So it really does um, work. Um, so, of course, thanks to our amazing donors, PanCan is going to invest over $28 million in research this next year. Can you talk a little bit about that $28 million investment? What are we investing in? Yeah, yeah, we invested in a couple different buckets. Um, one of it is where we have taken where I think one of the real strengths of PanCan is our amazing patient services and where we have more than 40,000 interactions with patients every year. So a number of years ago, we decided that a really good investment is research is that we're helping people every day, but let's learn from them as well so we can help people to, of the future people who are going to be facing pancreatic cancer. So that's where, for instance, our Know Your Tumor program came, came from. We help with precision medicine, but we learn from them as well so we can advance that field. The same with our patient registry. We learn a lot from that. So that's part of our research investment is in those kinds of activities. And then as we looked at that pyramid and we looked at how critical the clinical research was, um, we thought, well, there's an opportunity to um, accelerate and, and streamline the process of getting new drugs for the treatment of pancreatic cancer. Um, and so from that arose our Precision Promise initiative, where we're really trying to um, make much more efficient and cost effective and really speed up that whole process of clinical development to get new drugs um, for pancreatic cancer. And then at the other end of the spectrum, there's the early detection initiative, which is again, a clinical trial where we're trying to get the whole the community together around one initiative that can, um, that can really advance that field. And then finally, there's our grants program, which we've had since the beginning um, and which has really made a, a, a very big difference. And part of the grants program, part of the philosophy is we need to make sure there's people to get on that elevator, that we need to, to make sure that we support the career development of people in the field, that they become committed to pancreatic cancer. We need to get, um, we also need to get very, um, experienced and um, good investigators from other fields. We need to steal them and get them into pancreatic cancer. And so our research um, portfolio then is kind of spread over all those different areas where we see opportunities and gaps where we think we can really make a difference. Yeah, that's great. And so the rest of our um, expert panel have all received grants from us. So Len, what kind of grants do we fund? Yeah, so I did talk about the Career Development Awards, and, and Jillian is a, a recent um, awardee of that. So we're just delighted to have um, young, um, energetic, uh, new ideas, investigators come into the field. So we're welcoming you in, into our community for progress. Um, and then we have um, grants that go to very um, experienced and very good investigators like Channing and Susan. 
um, and that we're looking for those new ideas to, to bring into pancreatic cancer. Um, and, and then we have some grants as well where we, we look at our big initiatives like the Early Detection Initiative or the Precision Promise Initiative, and we see gaps where we need a kind of a specific kind of research in order to fill. And so we have a program as well that funds those kinds of grants as well. So again, we try to make the best use of that grant mechanism um, and find the opportunities that we think will really make a difference. Great. Thank you, Lynn. That was a terrific overview of sort of PanCan's philosophy and our current investment in research. So Channing, um, Lynn mentioned um, basic research, and that's an area maybe for us lay people, it's a little harder to under, always understand. We, we maybe understand the clinical end, but a little harder to understand the basic research end, but it's critically important for making progress. So talk to us, why is basic research so important for a disease like pancreatic cancer? Sure, so I, I, can, I can extend on, on the, Lynn's pyramid there at, and where she had basic research at the bottom. And I think it's symbolic that uh, basic research was the foundation for the translational research and then the subsequent clinical research. So uh, let, let me use my own research as an example to distinguish uh, the different layers of, of research. So my research has been on the RAS oncogene and it was first determined to be mutated in nearly 100% of pancreatic cancers. And the question of course is, is this going to be a great handle for developing therapies for pancreatic cancer? Well, you just don't jump into the process of making drugs simply by that observation because pancreatic cancer actually has many genetic alterations, approximately 60 to 70 mutated genes. And not all mutated genes actually are contributing to aberrant growth of pancreatic cancer. So we first have to determine, is RAS actually a driver of pancreatic cancer growth before we embark on drug discovery? So the first studies involve, is RAS an important driver of pancreatic cancer growth? Basic research allowed us to answer that question resoundingly saying that, yes, this is a key driver of pancreatic cancer growth but we're not ready yet to do drug discovery because drugs correct the defect. We first had to understand what does KRAS do? What is broken with KRAS in pancreatic cancer so that we can, then can begin the process of developing drugs to fix the mutant RAS genes in pancreatic cancer. So basic research does not lead immediately to therapies, but it sets the foundation for subsequent research that eventually leads us in that direction. That was a really terrific um, explanation, I think really clear. So, you know, how do then you take that? I know you're interested in translating, obviously all this work that you're doing in RAS and translating that to patients. How does that work? Can you talk about what you've done? Yes, so, so after we did the basic research to say that RAS is an important driver of pancreatic cancer growth, we then asked the question, how does it do it? Those studies led us to identify another protein called PERC, which seemed to be the key driver for how RAS drives pancreatic cancer growth. At that point, we decided to then pursue ERC as a therapeutic target. We, so we submitted our ideas to PANCAN and we were fortunate enough to get a, a research grant to study ERC in pancreatic cancer. Then our studies started going after ERC to say, is this a great therapeutic target? And the answers were sort of mixed, but the answers then led us to something that was unexpected. And I think this is an indication of how research goes. Oftentimes research does not go as planned. It leads us into different unexpected directions. But fortunately at that time, I had a very smart young researcher, Kirsten Bryant in the lab who said, okay, this did not seem to work as we had hoped, but let me think about what might this mean. And she figured out that the inability of inhibitors of ERK to work effectively was because pan pancreatic cancers adapted to blocking ERK by upregulation of a metabolic process called autophagy. Long story short, short, she decided that the combination of an ERK inhibitor together with an autophagy inhibitor might be a potential therapeutic strategy. And indeed, her studies led to a determination that that was the case. 
and it's allowed us to then initiate two clinical trials, one with collaborators at MD Anderson and a second clinical trial with collaborators at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. So at this point, we await to see how the ideas are translating to the patient. Oh, that's really exciting. Um, and exactly what you know we want to have happen that moves from the bottom of the pyramid, basic research all the way up to the clinic and being used in, in patients. So um, congratulations on that. And we look forward to seeing what the results of those trials are. So thank you, Chani. So Susan, um, you have been interested in finding new targets for the treatment of cancers, including pancreatic cancer, and determining how to best test them in clinical trials for many years. So this is something you're familiar with. Can you tell us about how this is done? So it's actually incredibly complex process. And I think uh, Dr. Durr outlined the initial steps of finding a target, that we don't always know that everything that looks abnormal and a cancer is important. So that's a huge first step. And then finding the drug to hit that target, another huge step. You know, and some people estimate at least a thousand drug ideas come up for every one that actually makes it into the clinic. So then you've got your drug candidate. Maybe you had the target and you did a library screening for it. You have to do the work in the laboratory to try to identify what cell type is important uh, and can we do this in pancreatic cancer? You know, if those of us who are looking for pancreatic cancer drugs, then you have to take it into animal studies to make sure that it's not um, too harmful to an animal to be able to take to patients. And so all that's called preclinical toxicology and pharmacology, where you learn a little bit about your drug. And very often, the first drug that you identified, maybe from a screen of thousands of compounds, doesn't turn out to be a real drug at all, and it has to be altered by a medicinal chemist. So then that medicinal chemist says, I'm gonna add this carbon or that you know, other molecule to make it better for a patient. And then finally, you've got what you need and you take that into the patient in a phase one clinical trial. And at that point in time, you're looking at safety, you're looking at, does it do anything at all? Well, that, um, that's what we call bench to bedside at that point. And then once you see, yes, it does, it does seem to make alterations for that patient. Maybe we get lucky and it works and makes the cancer shrink. Then you go back to the, back to the bench because now you have to find out how the patient metabolized it. That's what we call pharmacokinetics. You have to find out, did it turn RAS off? That's a really important question if you've got a RAS drug. So that's called pharmacodynamics. And then you've got to try to figure out a biomarker. How can I choose the patients that would be right for this? Because that's if we've learned, if we've learned one thing in the last two decades, it is that every drug is not going to work for every patient. And so we have to find drugs that work specifically for patients. And that's one of the things that led to the combination that I've been working on that Ping can actually funded was trying to think about specific subsets of patients. That's a great yeah. explanation and, and I think helpful because I think a lot of times, you know, lay people, donors, we, we wonder why does this take so long? <laughs> you know, and it, it really is a long process over many, many, many years. Um, you know, do you want to talk it's, about that timeline? Yeah, it is. I mean, the average has always been said to be 10 years to develop a drug from the time you know your target and the time you take that um, all the way to the clinic and prove success. Now, there have been some notable uh, successful exceptions to that, but that's the, um, that's the classic. And the, one of the drugs that I worked on from scratch actually took more like 15 years to get all the way to FDA approval. So it's, um, it's, it is a very complex process because sometimes the target doesn't turn out to be quite right or the way that it interacts with the target isn't quite right. Uh, so many, many missteps and you have to have, that's one thing wonderful about PanCan and it's grants, I mean, it's got the long view. And so I don't think if the first phase one doesn't turn out for PanCan, you're gonna say, I'm never gonna look at that again. And I think that's, that is really one of the terrific things about, because this is a, an organization with a long view, you know, that 
that you know that this is what's going to take to get there. And so, yeah. and, and you develop partnerships to try to overcome that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and, and um, you know, we're so grateful to all of you for sticking with it, right? You've got to stick with it um, and you eventually get there. Um, but probably as, you know, Channing also said, it takes different turns than, than maybe where you thought what you thought when you started. So Susan, can you tell us a little bit about what is your current research and why are you excited about it? Well, I am excited about it and I'm very grateful to PanCan for funding and I have to say that maybe four or five times because uh, I don't know that I would be able to be still working on it were it not for PanCan. The, uh, the field has been very interested in immunotherapy, the whole cancer field, not pancreatic cancer per se, has been, and so it's been hard to get things funded in the last, um, last five years because people really wanted to only fund immunotherapy projects. But for pancreatic cancer, immunotherapy has not currently been a strategy that worked out. And so PanCan's been willing to fund people who are working on things that weren't immunotherapy, unlike some other uh, institutions. So I'll just say that. Uh, but what I had been, I worked on for many years for over a decade on a drug called Romidepsin, which was a histone deacetylase inhibitor. Uh, it's an epigenetic agent. That means it doesn't uh, look for oncogenes like KRAS with a mutation. It looks for changes in how the DNA is expressed into RNA and proteins and tries to normalize that back into the way a cell should be, into a proper mature cell. And so we actually developed it in T-cell lymphoma. We found that it was um, uniquely effective in about a third of patients. But I had always been a solid tumor researcher. That's actually been my whole career. And so I said, well, maybe I can come to understand why it's successful in T-cell lymphoma and then translate that into solid tumors. So working on some of the solid tumor models that we had in the laboratory, we found, and um, we relied on a lot of, a lot of uh, Dr. Durr's work actually, and his work on KRAS and metabolism. And what we found was that Romidepsin actually uh, has a unique activity with pancreatic cancer and other types of cancers that have KRAS mutations. And what it seems to do is block the ability of the cell to recover when you starved it, uniquely if they have KRAS. So somehow KRAS is so dependent on these metabolic pathways and our, our epigenetic agent Romidepsin is blocking that pathway, that ability to use the pathway, to use the energetic pathways of the cell, and then they die. And so we said, well, what's important in KRAS and what's important downstream? And there's another um, molecule that Dr. Durs also worked on in the laboratory, uh, C-MIC. And so what we um, said, well, how could we interact with both metabolism and MIC and do that in a way that would be more effective than just trying to use one drug and pound that home. And so we uh, started looking at a drug that's known to turn off MYC. And we said, then we'll take that subset of patients with pancreatic cancer where MYC is turned on and we'll give them a drug that turns MYC off as a protein and Romidepsin, the two drugs together. And then that, and so what we did in the lab when we combined those two very low concentrations of those two drugs that we have, the one that turns MYC off and the one that is we've been using for 10 years, very low concentrations create what we call synergy. Once you have synergy, that is much more likely to end up being a real drug in, real, in, the, in the patient. Uh, because what we don't, we don't do well when we have to drive up a drug to a very high concentration to make it work in patients. We do a lot better if we can combine two unique vulnerabilities and put those together. So we are currently, and again, that's thanks to PanCan, I wouldn't be doing it otherwise, doing the very expensive animal studies to try to say, not only can we prove synergy in the laboratory, we've got reams of that, but we can show it happens in animals too without too much toxicity. And then once we get those early animal studies going, then the next step is to do the toxicology, the pharmacology, and then go into the clinic. And so that's 
basically how translational research works when it works well, and I'm sure there'll be obstacles along the road. Great, well, thank you. That was a terrific explanation. And again, showing how complicated it all is um, and, and how important the funding, the kind of funding that PanCam provides is to allowing you to do this important it's, work. It's just more, it's less institutional and more uh, flexible and um, more connected in many ways with other people in the field. You know, that's one of the things I really value about PanCan is the community of researchers that are together and everyone working toward the same goal. It's a wonderful organization. And I, I mean, not to go off topic, I'm sorry, <laughs> but the, uh, the donors that give to PanCan are giving to an amazing organization, I think. The fact that you support research you support patient call lines, you support, pay, you know, you've sent me uh, things that I hand out to patients on a regular basis to let them know about the, their disease. Um, I have patients really struggling over what should I eat? What can I eat? What's gonna make my cancer better? What's not? I mean, and after a while I say, you know what? Call PanCan because they have a whole support line that will talk to you about all these things. Um, so I just, it's a tremendous organization. Well, thank you. Thank you for being a fan. Um, <laughs> and I also appreciate that you pointed out, you know, earlier that, you know, you learned from uh, the work that Channing's doing in his lab. And I'm sure others are learning from the work that you're doing in your lab. And that's really how it works. Not one person can do all of it. And you right. all build off of each other in order to make progress. So thank that's you. Right. Susan. So Jillian, you're an epidemiologist and a behavioral scientist. So can you explain to everyone, what does that mean? Yes, my trajectory is a little bit different um, and maybe an unusual pathway here, but um, epi epidemiology, as we have all learned in the last year, it's an extremely broad discipline and encompasses so many really interesting disciplines as well. So not just infectious disease, but also um, cancer epidemiology, which is what I, I was training in, as well as in the clinical trials and methods track, and then also looking at cardiovascular disease, looking at um, all sorts of age, our epidemiology of aging. So it is really broad and um, I've had the fortune to be able to study under wonderful mentors who really helped shape my future and my interest and research interest. Um, many, two of whom were pancreatic cancer research oncologists and physicians. So I definitely am thankful for them for initially really exciting me about wanting to continue to research. And then also in patient reported outcomes and quality of life and survivorship research. So early on, I was interested in really engaging patients in their treatment decisions and care. And I, I've built upon it over the last few years through my master's degree, my doctoral degree, my postdoc, which focused a little bit more on clinical trials again and really honing in on some of the skills in um, clinical research and oncology trials. And, and then through this career development award, now I'm able to continue this research and continue building and learning and really um, trying to do a better job at bringing everything together and everything that I've learned through um, my training, through epidemiology, so the methods, what to apply, what are the ideal study designs that can help us answer these questions, and, and then also hopefully take that and use it to improve and apply in the clinic and improve our patients' lives and um, reduce toxicity and increase survivorship and quality of life. So very excited that I'm able to really learn from everybody and take a little bit of everything to be able to, to apply it to this work. That's great. And thank you for sharing. You know, so we love to hear about how um, junior investigators in particular come to focus on pancreatic cancer. And it sounds like you've had some really great mentors in this in this field. I think we might know them. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So it's an it's important that we approach a complicated disease like pancreatic cancer from many different angles. So you have some really interesting work you're doing through your PanCan funded research grant. So tell us about it. Yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm very interested again in trying to find ways that we can enhance care, not just in the clinic, but outside of the clinic, which would lead to hopefully improving health related quality of life, but also maybe preventing um, 
functional decline, which we um, we had conducted a survey a couple of years ago and learned as we spoke to the different patients that physical function was actually ranked first above pain, above other concerns and other patient reported outcomes that had been identified as priorities as the most important. So learning that um, helped me and our team realize how important it is to also be able to find and identify strategies that we can then improve physical function and hopefully help delay or prevent its decline. But first of all, are we even able to measure it accurately? And so bringing back the epidemiology, uh, one of the questions just, what are some objective measures um, and how can we be a little bit more accurate and um, a little bit more advanced and sophisticated in how we can assess physical function and, and um, during the pandemic. So I actually received this award um, in 2020 and early on, and I've been fascinated with remote monitoring and ways to continuously monitor patient activity. So we are using Fitbits for this particular study, but there's a lot of different types of devices and monitors. And thanks to the advancement in technology, especially in the last few years, we've been able to monitor over longer periods of times, daily activity, which may include sleep patterns, which is um, of interest to patients. So it's not just thinking about exercise or physical activity, but how they all fit together and patterns of sedentary behavior. And then how these activity patterns, and we're talking a little bit more about digital phenotyping now, how they can then help us understand the patient's performance status. How do they correlate or relate to what they're, um, they are being assessed in the clinic, such as with the ECOG or KPS performance status, but also some of the objective measures. So looking at hand grip, um, walking, gait speed, and chair stand. So trying to bring that again all together and then use it to identify and um, I guess develop tailored strategies to then um, set goals and test it in an interventional setting to improve the physical function. And, and then hopefully validate these methods so we can do a better job just outside the clinic as well in connecting our patients and caring for them. So. That's really terrific, really important um, information or study that isn't, there's not a lot being done in that area. So we're really thrilled that you're doing it. And certainly I think a question that's been a question for a long time in pancreatic cancer is how do you know when a patient should no longer be on their current treatment and should be moving to the second, you know, the next option and, you know, the kind of work that you're doing certainly could help um, potentially answer those kinds of questions in the future. So, so thank you, um, Jillian. So um, we, as, Pan, or as Lynn mentioned at the beginning, um, one of uh, PanCAN's you know, long-term goals has been to fund junior investigators, to fund career development awards in order to build the field, in order to grow more researchers that are focused in this disease. So Jillian, as a, as a career development award um, recipient, um, as a junior investigator, what, what, why was getting a PanCAN career development award um, important to you and meaningful in your career? Um, it, it is such an honor, first of all, to have been selected as a recipient of this award, and I'm so thankful to the donors and so thankful again to PanCAN for believing in this research, and it, especially as a junior investigator and new faculty member, it's really helped me um, just set off and start establishing a research program and really being able to conduct research and gain the experience as a principal investigator running the study, and it's been so rewarding to be able to conduct the research, but another really important component is receiving the training as well. So it also includes mentorship and taking formal courses and attending different webinars and other workshops so that I can continue to learn and build and, and learn from you know, Dr. Bates and Dr. Dara and everyone else um, to help me acquire the skills that are required to become an independent investigator, which is the goal and to specialize and continue to hopefully research pancreatic cancer and lead to future funding opportunities. And even a year into this, I have learned so much and I have so many exciting ideas of where I wanna take it next. And I think that may also be one of the goals. So again, I'm very excited and so happy that they're also funding and prioritizing research and survivorship. That's terrific. Well, congratulations again. We're so thrilled yeah. you're a part of our community for progress. And I can only imagine great things for you um, in the future. So, so thank, thank you, Jillian, you. for your important work. 
Um, so Channing, um, there's been some scientists in your lab that have received career development awards. In fact, you mentioned Kirsten Bryant earlier. Um, so from your perception, you know, as, as the person running the lab, why are these awards um, important? You're on mute, Channing. Yeah, so, so I'll continue using Kirsten as a great example of, of the impact of a career development award and the impact for her was twofold. One was, it's very difficult to get an academic position and getting the career development award was an indication that the research community believed that she had great promise and great ideas. She was able to leverage that to gain her own ac independent academic position and furthermore, to gain NIH funding. The second impact, which is equally important, if not more important than the money actually, is something that's unique for PanCan support. And I've not seen this for any other support from other foundations, which is the integration of the awardee into the pancreatic cancer community. The annual retreats and the meetings that we have where the young investigator has an opportunity to get to know who's who in the field, to get to learn and make connections, to have collaborations, that has been immensely invaluable for Kirsten to get a immediate head start into the pancreatic cancer field. And so for her, certainly that was an important part, which is relatively unique for pancreatic cancer support in that there's this integration of all the awardees into the community and an opportunity to network and to collaborate and these days, it's almost essential for great research because research moves too quickly. We can't be experts in everything. And the ability to connect with other researchers who can help you is just an amazing ability to really take the research to another level. So certainly the Career Development Award that Kirsten got basically allowed her to become a rising star in the field of pancreatic cancer research. Yeah, that's terrific. And we love it that, that you and Kirsten come to our annual advocacy day and join us in Washington, D.C. I know that means a lot to our, our patients and our volunteers um, to have you, you with us. So thank you that you, you both have done that. <laughs> So Channing, you also sit on PanCan Scientific and Medical Advisory Board, um, and you've attended PanCan's you know, scientific summits for many years. And one of the things that we think is important is that grantees present their work and get feedback from the community. So why is that important? Yeah, so, so I had mentioned earlier that uh, research is, is complicated these days. Pancreatic cancer is very complicated. We are not experts in everything. And as smart as we might are, be in our area, we can only look at a problem in one direction. So when we present our research to the greater community, we have other experts in the room who are better at things than we are, and they see things in a different way. And they say, have you considered thinking about this? Or should you think about maybe looking at the question in this direction? So it allows us researchers to get feedback and ideas that we might not have even considered. And it also allows us to establish collaborations of other investigators who bring expertise that we don't have to the table. And the net result is that we can do more advanced research and we can done, get it done much faster as well. Terrific. So Susan, I'll ask you a similar question. You um, attended PanCan's uh, Scientific Summit, I think the first time a few years ago. What do you see as the value of bringing everyone together like that? And you mentioned it a bit when you spoke earlier. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, I do think there's there's great value in, in meeting together because you, it's a, and the pandemic has been very difficult for this. I mean, you've done a great job trying to, band-aid it over for that, but I think it'll be wonderful when we can finally have meetings again, because you tell someone what you're working on and they say, well, have you tried this or have you tried that? So many, many uh, steps forward actually come from discussions like that, that you have at these meetings. And when it's uh, PanCan, it's just people who are interested in things like KRAS and pancreatic cancer and things like 
you know, cancer cachexia and things like physical function and uh, how might all those be connected? They probably are. And the work of all three of us is probably highly connected, actually. Yep, great. So I'm gonna ask you one, one final question and then we'll go over to, there's questions coming in from the audience. So what are you most excited about in terms of what you heard at the scientific summit or what's happening um, in just in pancreatic cancer research? Um, Lynn, shall I start with you? Yeah, boy, it's hard to choose what, what I'm really most excited about, but I'm actually going to give a tip to Jillian because I thought her talk was really quite um, innovative and um, really got PanCan, again, thinking about this, um, you know, taking the next step on to really helping patients cope with the treatment, cope with, you know, and, and, and be much healthier as they, um, as they go forward. So to me, that was adding a, a dimension to our programs that um, we haven't spent as much time thinking about and working on. And I really appreciated that, um, that we now have Jillian working on that and making sure all the rest of us keep that in mind um, as we go forward. So thank you, Jillian. <laughs> Great. Susan, how about you? Uh, I think the thing other than my own work, which I'm very excited about, but I think that um, the precision pro promise concept and the fact that that's coming to fruition, I love the trial design where you have um, a platform or an umbrella and you have drugs that come in and come out and everything gets a chance and you don't, you know, that design can be refined to where you only treat 18 or 20 patients total before you find out if something actually works or not. I mean, that is incredibly efficient and way better than the standard investigator initiated trial that we all end up trying to do. And I've seen sometimes 40 patients put on a trial without really seeing enough activity to have been worth 40 patients and just because that's the old fashioned design and the precision promise is a new kind of design that's been, uh, it, it should be being used far more often but there are isolated pockets where it's being used and this is one and I'm excited about that. Great, thanks. Yeah, we're excited about Precision Promise. Certainly a big investment for PanCan, but we think one that's really going to pay off for patients. Channing, how about you? So I, ha I have to bring up RAS, of course. Um, <laughs> we've been working on this for some time. There's been great promise. But I must say, there were times when I wondered really whether we were going to cross the finish line with this. There are times when people would say, what's new? And I said, well, we're still trying. We're still trying. Well, this year, for the first time, the first KRAS drug was finally approved for lung cancer. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. There are now additional uh, KRAS drugs that are poised to enter the clinic. So I, I think that the next two years are gonna be really exciting times where we're gonna make a significant impact on the treatment of KRAS mutant pancreatic cancers. Yeah, that would be really, really exciting and have such a tremendous impact for patients. So we're, we're, we're behind you. Go, go, go do it. <laughs> um, Jillian, how about you? I, well, thank you, Lynn. By the way, it's really exciting to hear that you were excited about the research um, that I presented. And I actually was also, well, I loved, you know, just the research caliber in general and being able to listen and again, feel part of this community, which has become very apparent to me very quickly. And, um, and I was excited to hear the career, the other career development awardees present their work. And it feels, you know, we will be future colleagues and hopefully be able to work again together and connect um, beyond beyond this. So that's always exciting. And, and I was excited about Precision Promise and just there's a lot of overlap and really exciting ideas and opportunities between some of the things I'm interested in as well as what is being done there. So I hope that it you know leads to future opportunities and can't wait to hear updates from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, it will be exciting to hear updates. 
Um, well, I've been very informal this whole time calling you all by your first names, but I just want to say thank you to Dr. Matrizian, Dr. Bates, Dr. Durr, and Dr. Grisham. I'm so um, very um, grateful for everything that you do for PanCan and for the tremendous research efforts that you all are undertaking. I have no doubt that it will have um, impact on patients' lives. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions coming in from the audience. So um, we won't probably be able to everyone out there. We won't be able to get to all of these questions, but we'll have someone from PanCan follow up with you if we're not able to get to all of your questions. And I would encourage you, if you're asking a question, it's more about a personal, um, about a patient, um, to call our PanCan patient services and they can help you with those types of questions. So Lynn, there's a few questions that have come in around early detection about what's happening in early detection. You of course mentioned our early detection initiative, but maybe you can talk a little bit about what's happening in the space. Yeah, it really feels like there's real momentum in that space. Um, there are a number of studies that have been done looking at um, individuals who have, are at high genetic risk for pancreatic cancer and figuring out how are we gonna find it early in those individuals. And then of course, our early detection initiative is looking at individuals with new onset diabetes, um, trying to look at um, whether we can, can devise an early detection strategy for that. Um, those have been pretty much um, dependent on imaging, when you take somebody to imaging, when you're actually going to look for it. But the, the really exciting advance in the last year or so has been a blood test, um, actually two blood tests um, that give us, in essence, a signal um, that maybe someone should go get imaging. Maybe now's the time to get imaging for those individuals. One is a pancreatic cancer specific blood test called by a company called Immunovia. And another one is for, for a number of cancers, but include pancreatic cancer from a company called Grail. So um, there's still more work to be done to really understand um, if it, how well it works in a, in a pre-diagnostic population and how we're going to, you know, all the, all the research isn't figured out, but those tests are now available. And um, if anybody's really interested in learning more about them, our patient services can tell you more about them, um, know whether that makes sense for you or not. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so, but I think there have been real, I see real momentum in both um, figuring out what population we need to look at and then um, what are we going to do with that population in order to find um, pancreatic cancer earlier? So it's, a, it's an exciting time. Great. Perfect. Um, so Susan, there's some questions about specific mutations, and we won't get into probably all the specific mutations, but maybe could you just describe for people, how do we understand what mutations someone might have so that we can determine the best treatment for them? So we're generally, and most institutions are sending off um, somewhere, for example, the Know Your Tumor program. Uh, we, many, Columbia has its own. Uh, many people send to foundations, some send to Keras, some send to PanCan. So there's a variety of ways and about 500 genes are looked at to see whether there's a alteration in a gene in a cancer that might be one of the drivers. And so KRAS is there very often, but then there are others and we're always looking for something that might be considered a target. Not everything. I saw that someone asked about CDK N2A and unfortunately we don't have a drug for that at the moment. That's usually loss of a gene. It's harder to, it's harder to fix a gene that's been lost than to do something about a gene that's been turned on. And so gradually we're getting through all of these different genes to evaluate their ability to be a target or not. And I have to say that the ability to find these mutations uh, is the, the, to find the changes is far out ahead of the ability to know if the change is important. Many people have something called a variant of unknown significance. And then even if we know it's important, we're still far ahead of our ability to have a drug. So this the molecular, everybody wants it, everyone wants to do it, every doctor wants it, every patient wants it, but it's still a lot of work to be done in that area. 
So a lot of the questions can't be answered specifically. And KRAS is a good example. The G12C, which is the mutation that's in lung cancer is not the main mutation in pancreatic cancer. So we need our own drug for pancreatic cancer. Great, perfect. Um, there's a question here about, um, is there anything being done to find the cause of pancreatic cancer? I don't know if Channing or Lynn, you wanna take that one? Just generally. Well, um, I, I think that um, in some ways, pancreatic cancer is a simple cancer in that it is, it is so addicted to RAS that basically RAS mutations are the basis for the initiation and growth and progression of virtually every pancreatic cancer. The small handful of pancreatic cancers that don't have KRAS mutations have mutations in other components associated KRAS signaling. So it seems as if this, this is a cancer that seems to be in particularly addicted to KRAS. So can I, can I add to that? Sure, please. Um, and he's totally right. But what is fascinating is that we don't know, we don't have a clue about what causes the KRAS mutation. And that may be actually random and due to, in some cases, that your ability to screen for these mutations is, is uh, impaired. And that brings us to the issue of people who inherit uh, a mutation. And so there's been a big change in the field in the last four years in our understanding of who has hereditary pancreatic cancer. I mean, that's still a label that's applied to families of pancreatic cancer. And we now know a lot of the genes that clearly cause pancreatic cancer in families. But it's now recommended that anyone who had a pancreatic uh, anyone who had a family member with pancreatic cancer that never got genetic testing, that person should be genetically tested because enough of them, it's a high enough percentage, probably pushing 10% or more are now identified to be due to a loss of the ability of DNA to repair properly when a mistake is made. So there's something about that DNA repair that's really critical and that's gonna be a big subject uh, going for the next decade, I'm sure, getting all those pieces worked out. But um, we're now testing the germline. That means what you inherited on every single patient. And as I just said, I'll just repeat it because I saw someone asked about that. If you had a family member who had pancreatic cancer 20 years ago, you should go get tested. And I have a friend uh, who whose uh, mother had pancreatic cancer 10 years ago, she was never tested. And I keep telling her, you've got to get tested. Um, it's just the current recommendation. Great, and Lynn, did you wanna add? Yes, yes, there, um, that's exactly right, that we found that there's an awful lot of cases now where there are those alterations that we never knew about. Either the families weren't big enough or there wasn't a record of you know, what people died of or that type of thing where there really is a, a gene that's being passed on and that we should know about that. Mm -hmm. um, what we, we absolutely recommend that pancreatic cancer patients should all be tested, have their germline tested, know whether that was caused by, a, um, by, the, by one of these mutations that's inherited. Um, if it's negative, then there's probably no sense in their first degree relatives to be tested because we know what that was. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't know what it is, then, then, it, does, then it does deserve more um, looking into. And a genetic counselor would look at a pedigree and see you know, how many people were affected and that type of thing. So you, would, you, you need some, um, some, some a professional counseling, I think, at that point to really understand it. And so that you know when the results, if you do get tested, when the results come in, how to interpret them. Um, so we do recommend that those individuals um, seek, talk to their doctor, talk to a genetic counselor, um, seek more advice on how to, how to explore that possibility. 
Terrific. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our audience for so many questions. I know we did not get to all of them. There were lots of, there were some questions around, you know, clinical trials, around testing, um, around specific mutations. Please call Pain Camp's Patient Services, and our case managers can help you with some of those um, specific questions. Um, and thank you again to our amazing um, panel of experts. Um, you, it was a very engaging um, discussion and I think gave people a real sense of um, you know, the complexity of the research that you are all doing, but that we are making progress. And I saw of just how um, happy people are to see just your enthusiasm and your motivation and how excited you are about what you're, what you're all doing. So, so thank you again to, to all of you. Um, so before we conclude here, I just want to give a quick reminder to save the date to join us on November 18th for our annual World Pancreatic Cancer Day webinar um, at 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern time. And you can watch your inbox for more information so that you can register for that webinar. As I've said now a couple of times, please remember that our patient central call um, center is available for your calls Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. Pacific time to 5 p.m. Pacific time. And a lot of the questions that I see in the chat um, are amazing case managers in our patient services program can help you. And finally, if you want to know more about the impact you are making um, on, on all the things that PanCan is able to do um, because of you, please reach out to your PanCan staff partner or contact Lisa Gray, who is here, whose information is here on the screen. So a tremendous thank you to everybody for attending today, for um, your amazing contributions, for making our visionary belief um, in what is possible. Um, we could not do this without you. And I'm just so incredibly grateful to each and every one of you. You help make everything that we do possible. So thank you, everyone. Please stay safe um, and have a great rest of the week. Thank you.